<laughs> so if you could stay, that's going to be today at 1 o'clock. And then we have this coming up this Saturday, Mike Hutchings. We have a lot of people already registered online. You could do that through our website. It's kingofkingswc, okay, kingofkingswc.com. We're really beefing up the website. There's a lot more. There's going to be products, uh, book sales and things on there as well. And we have a designer in our church who's working on sweatshirts with our logo on it and T-shirts. And, yeah, a lot of cool things that uh, it's already right in the church, you know. And, and the uh, website makes it easy to do that. But this is a serious topic, right? It's post-traumatic stress and healing trauma of all kinds. And if you're a social media person and you follow our Facebook page, you might have seen the video that was posted yesterday of Mike Hutchings' brother-in-law who was healed of a, of a brain tumor the size of an orange. They, they took out part of it, but they couldn't take all of it out. And, and within a short time when he went back in, it was completely gone. And that's the cover of the video is the tumor on this side and no tumor on this side, same guy. And uh, he, he gives a very um, humble, the man that got healed gives a very humble testimony of, you know, he said, if you think it's about earning healing because you are such a strong Christian, he was not a strong Christian at the time. And that's not what God's love is about, right? It's about open heavens over our lives and availing ourselves of the power of the kingdom that's available here while we're alive. And that will be another day's teaching. But that's, his, that's the guy, Brian Gardner. That's his name. He was healed from a terminal brain tumor. And this is Mona's picture uh, of Urban Revival Project. Again, if you go on our website, you'll see the different ministries that we support under missions. And it's local, but we're also starting to support one now in India. I think, Trisha, did you mention that when you were up here just now? Or, or, yeah, so Trisha's been to this ministry in India, which is an orphanage. So, you know, we just want you to know that there's um, a lot going on beyond just the four walls here. And including that, we're working very hard to make the deaconry property a distribution center for feeding hands. So it doesn't have to be down at the Raritan Circle, but we could actually be giving out food right here. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of ways you can put your hand to the plow, you know, as it says in the King James Version. It's also the one-year anniversary of the COVID lockdown. Not something anybody wants to clap about, I'm sure, but it's really, you know, a reflective thing to think about the last year, right? Like a, a year ago, we were in 219 Mount Airy Road, and Chuck Pierce... I mean, it actually would be tomorrow, but you know how it works, you know, one day off a year. But it was the Sunday of March 8th that year, last year, that he was speaking at our church. And prophetic words, you don't always fully understand them. I mean, I would say normally you don't understand them when you hear them right away. But you pray into them, and you write them down, and you transcribe them. And all those things are easier to do now than ever. So, you know, get your phone out, record the word if you hear it, and then test the word. Be like the Bereans. Go back and test the word and then pray into it. And this is one, just a part of what Chuck said. Again, you can see the video. We posted it yesterday on the Facebook page and the YouTube channel. But part of what he said was, I say this, this is the ending of a season, but I already have your new direction in place. Now, in one way, that referred to the fact that we were moving. So we knew that we were moving out of 219 Mount Airy, but it was still nice to hear it come through the prophetic word. Chuck hadn't been here. He hadn't seen it. And in fact, he said, I don't want to see it in the natural yet. I just want to see it in the spirit. You know, and that's what true prophets do. They don't want to be tainted by, by this realm. They want to hear from the heavenly realm, right? You will be moving. You will be moving with me, God is saying through Chuck, into that place that I have for you. I can't tell you how comforting that was, trying to move during COVID, right? Because, like, here's, here's the curveball. If there's no COVID, you still have to move. You still have to reconstruct this chapel. I could show you the video someday of what this looked like before we came in here. And, you know, it's, it turned into a beautiful place, don't you think? Like, it's really amazing. But, you know, that's that you had to see by vision. There was no balcony. There was no lobby. There was no children's room back there or green room. So I have to thank Sandy Damata also. We get a lot of compliments about the colors and all. That was somebody in our church here named Sandy Damata. I think she's my here. Okay, here she is. She's uh, really blessed us mightily. And I have to also say Dave Torres because he and his father, I don't know if Tom Torres is here, but Tom was the general contractor for this job. And, you know, when you're trying to then do this move during COVID, it means people were told they can't show up for their work jobs. 
And if you know anything about construction, everything's on a time frame. And if one part gets delayed and the delivery gets delayed, that stops the other people from doing what they are. And everybody's schedule is all getting thrown off. But God, but God, we started doing our live stream from the upper room. We never missed, I don't think we missed, we might have missed one live stream service for some technical thing, but that's pretty good in a, in a year. And it kept on plowing along. And you all were just so faithful and kept giving. And there's no debt on this building. We didn't just do this building. We also did uh, another building, the rec center that David was talking about where the children are. Um, so, like, to look back, it was the year of the Lord's favor for the church, even though a lot of stress and struggle was happening. And I would keep going back to this word, and, and the Lord was saying through Chuck, you will be moving with me, Peter. <laughs> God saying, you're not moving. I'm going there, and you're coming with me. <laughs> and, man, that helps. I have to tell you, that helps. And you'll be developing a model, back to what Chuck was saying. Not a model that you've seen or been aligned with, but a model of change that is needed. The model you build will be a model that is sent out and recreated throughout the entire region. I say get ready. I'm causing a center, this would be part of that, a center to be established. I lost my place. So that meetings can, I'm sorry, out of the center, a new plan of meetings will come and a new mobilization will come. A people will arise and say, beginning in March, the wind blew in 2020, his hand moved and we were established to advance into our future. Wow, do this with me. I'm moving forward. <laughs> we are advancing into our future. Yeah. So I feel very grateful for that alignment that we have with Chuck and so many other people that have been through here to speak, and they'll be coming back in here again to speak, including Mike Hutchings. Uh, the relationships that we built over the years are just priceless to me. And some of the people that we interviewed during that COVID time, during lockdown, like Mario Murillo and, and many others, are just really valuable relationships that we have that speak context into us, not just the local church in northern New Jersey, but part of a much bigger national and international community. Um, and, and what I would finish this part with is from Esther chapter 4. I know a lot of you know we just came through Purim on the Jewish calendar. And you also know a very famous verse in the Bible from the book of Esther is for such a time as this. Right? And you could say, well, you know, you could, well, you could always say it's for such a time as this. I'm going to make the case now that it's also a word for us, for this church, for our leadership team, the people we're connected with that Yes, there are opposing forces, but yes, we are also, we have been equipped to handle those opposing forces and that we are here, too, for such a time as this. So the voice version, Esther 4.13 says, and now Mordecai had to speak to the servants of Esther. Mordecai was her uncle, but he couldn't speak to her directly. So they came to him and gave him a message from Esther, and he's saying, okay, when you go back, this is what I want you to tell her. And he loved her. You know that, right? Tell Esther, don't be fooled. Just because you are living inside the king's palace doesn't mean that you, out of all the Jews, will escape the carnage. Strong word. The carnage. Genocide is what was on the table. You must go before your king. <laughs> now that's got a little baggage in it too, right? Because before this she says... I haven't been called, and if he doesn't call you, you can't go in. And if you go in without him calling you and he doesn't extend the scepter, it's curtains, as they used to say, right? <laughs> curtains, <laughs> if you're from Brooklyn. <laughs> if you stay silent during this time, deliverance for the Jews will come from somewhere, but you, my child, and all your father's family will die. And who knows? Perhaps you've been made queen for such a time as this. And who knows, king of kings, perhaps you've been placed here for such a time as this. We're not holding on in the bunker saying, Jesus, come back and get us. It's terrible down here. We're going to occupy until he comes. That's the determination. That's also a kingdom theology that, that we, can, we can go you know, as long as you want, hours and hours, we could tell you how it's been misread to think that once you're a Christian, the only goal is to die and go to heaven. No, we're supposed to occupy until he comes. The kingdom of God suffers violence, and the violence take it by force. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifest, that he might destroy the works of the devil. As the Father sent me, so I'm sending you, not into the closet to hide. <laughs> Getting a little belligerent up here, I think. <laughs> 
I need a vision. I, I need to have a purpose when I get up every morning. I have to feel like I'm contributing my time and my effort toward a redemptive goal. And, and I know we are, and I hope you can join with us. So the word he gave me was mercy triumphs over judgment. I'll try to unpack that in a relatively short time. Uh, you, you might be able to read it. It's Micah 6, 8. It says, do justly, love mercy, walk humbly, right? That's from the Old Testament. And this is mercy triumphs over judgment, which is from James chapter 2, verse 13. So we're going to unpack that a little. Can you just, uh, this is the picture I'm getting. Put your hand over your heart and say, Lord, my heart is good ground, and I receive good seed today. I receive the meal that you want to feed me. And touch your head and say, Lord, my mind is open to be renewed by your word. I want to walk out of here different than I walked in, more like Jesus and less like my carnal nature. Only you can do that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't ever forget that one, right? If Paul said he has not arrived, then we should never think that we're going to completely arrive in this, in this life, right? And then 2 Corinthians 3.18 in the NIV version says that we are being transformed into the image of God with ever-increasing glory here in this life. So if you need a mission statement, that's a good place to start. Being transformed. Being transformed. You might say, well, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. But then why does Paul say, you're still on the milk, and I want you to be on the meat I want you to grow up. I want you to mature, right? So we're being transformed. That's our goal is to be an imitation of Christ, to be a reflection, an ambassador of his in the earth. All right? So you mind just cut me a little slack. I'm going to go fast. I want to cover some scriptures. You don't have to take a lot of notes because you could just watch it online afterwards if you want. But I just want you to keep your spirit open to the, to the linkage that I'm going to try to put out here for you. I... Um, tend to talk too long, I guess you could say, but I have a lot to say. <laughs> James 2.12 says, so speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Can you say that with me? For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. All right, so that, that 13 is a big deal today because there's a lot of people being canceled for making a mistake. That's part of what they call the culture today is the cancel culture. That's not Jesus. Man, if there was a cancel culture, I would have never been allowed in. So I hope all of us realize Ephesians 2 is such a cornerstone when it says, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. Do you believe that? I hope you do, but don't forget it now that you're a Christian. Don't forget, I once was dead. And then verse 2 says, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. That's a good translation, right? We were working for a boss, and we didn't know it. His name is the devil, and he's a really mean boss because he's a liar. And you don't want to work for somebody who's a liar. You want to work for the truth. Okay, and it looks fun. I mean, obviously, he's a good liar, so he tempts you to, to, to disobey God, and there is pleasure in sin for a season. Biblical phrase, right? Moses stood the test because he was willing to be persecuted with the people of God rather than indulge in the pleasures of sin, right, for a season. So we need the discipline to avoid those temptations. It's not by our might or by our power. It's the spirit of the holy God living in us that gives us the strength to do what we can't do in our own ability. But God, who is rich in mercy, oh, I love this, he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Jesus from the dead. You with me? Does anybody here think you didn't need to get salvation? Okay, so you can't forget that forgiveness was extended to you. And turn around and not extend forgiveness to other people. And it doesn't give them a license to sin against you or for, for them to just run all over you. But... As it said in that prior verse, I'll just go back to it quickly. Judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. So when you're humbled and you realize that you're going to make a mistake between now and the rest of your life. Anybody want to disagree with that one? Yeah, no, we didn't stop sinning when we became a Christian, but we have access to a kingdom where we can be forgiven and grow and get tools to help us stop sinning. 
But if I know that between now and the the day I die, I will sin again, then I'm going to hope that whoever I sinned against is going to show mercy, not judgment. But the formula here says judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. So if I'm living my life constantly being the police officer of the kingdom of God, judging everybody for what they're doing wrong, then when my turn comes to expect to be able to receive some mercy, it's not going to happen. Right? Judge not lest ye be judged, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. For with the measure you judge, it will be measured back to you. And who are you to say that there's a speck in your brother's eye when you have telephone pole <laughs> sticking out of your eye? Anyway, that's another day's teaching. This is about what happens when we're not willing to forgive and extend mercy. And I, only, I could give you many examples, but this is one that always stuck out to me. Way back in Genesis 27, it says Esau, what, hated Jacob. That's not good in a family, is it? Esau hated Jacob because their father had given Jacob the blessing. And Esau began to scheme. I will soon be mourning my father's death. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. Maybe there was a little Sicilian blood in there. I don't know, but that, that could be. I, I can only say that because I am half. <laughs> So we're allowed to pick on our own people, right? But when you're, when you're allowing something to just cook in the oven and you're, you're planning, like Absalom did this too because his brother Amnon had raped his sister and it says he didn't say anything, but the, but the scheme was cooking on the inside. That's like poison in your system. And the more you keep justifying and thinking about it and giving yourself a reason to do it, then eventually you can pull the trigger. And the wording in 42 is really telling... Rebecca is their mother, right, Esau and Jacob's mother. She heard about Esau's plans, and she sent for Jacob and told him, listen, Esau is consoling himself by plotting to kill you. And I I think if we were all honest, there have been times that we wanted to say something in the moment, and then when we got out here, we said, oh, why didn't I say that? Remember that? You've done that? And then it's like, I should have just put my fingers and my hands around their neck and started choking them. (laughs) No, not as a Christian, you would never say that, I'm sure. But back in the old days. But that scheme to take somebody down through their reputation, through gossip, rumors, however, it's the same idea, right? It's taking vengeance for a wrong. When we all know the Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. But we say, you need a little help on this one, God, because it's taking too long. I could just picture as Esau is going to sleep and he's bothered by something, he's picturing his hands going around his brother's neck and just choking him. And as we see his eyes popping out, and somehow that's consoling him. That's not a good thing, but it happens all the time. And that's what the cancel culture is partly about. There's no mercy. There's no forgiveness, and, and it, it's really not a good long-term plan because you will make a mistake. All right, so I said, canceled. Expect no mercy in Pottersville. <laughs> I mean, that movie has got a billion correlations between God's kingdom and the world's kingdom, and it's really powerful to think about one life. What a difference that town if one guy wasn't there. And, of course, that's representing God in a person because Pottersville is what we say all the time. It's a a cold, cruel world. That's Pottersville. Remember? What was his name? Uncle? The uncle that lost the money? Billy. Uncle Billy had a little drinking problem, and he's getting an attitude with Mr. Potter in the bank, and he forgets that the money is in the newspaper, right? Right? And now Mr. Potter gets it. Now, what would a Christian do, I think, would give the money back, right? Like, that's why we know what we're differently, because I think there's a calculation in our brain to say, you know what? If I steal this money from him right now, I might keep it for a while, but something bad's going to happen down the road, right? Now, that's not karma. That's, that's, that's the rules of the Word of God. You don't steal, Right in the Ten Commandments. Don't steal. And when you disobey the laws, the the protection of God comes away because the blessing comes in obedience. It's not that God wants to punish you. You step outside the protection because you disobeyed him. But you come back into the protection by asking for forgiveness. And look, he said pick up your cross every day. 
like, I'm sorry to keep reminding you of that, but, you know, that means that there's, a, there's always going to be something he's willing to work on with us. So I'm not expecting them to think like we do, and that's a good picture of the culture right now, is this guy saying, who are you? I've got the reins, and Jimmy Stewart's looking at him and saying, hey, can you give me a break? And what ended up happening in that movie, you know how awesome it is, is that it was the town, the people rallied around and kept bringing the money into the bank so that they could make it, right? That's what the body of Christ is supposed to do. We're supposed to rally. We don't look at somebody and say, you're hopeless, you can never change. Because God would never say a person could never change. You would have said that about the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus until Jesus appeared to him. And he says, well, who are you, Lord? I'm the one that you're fighting against. And then he becomes an author of you know, a huge chunk of the Bible, right? So you never know. Here's the deal. Live as if it's possible that that person could change, even if you've seen no change, because God can change anybody. And he expects us to try to do that. So this is the quote from Matthew 6.12, which is in the Lord's Prayer, and it's in the Passion Translation. Forgive us the wrongs we have done, Lord, as we ourselves release forgiveness to those who have wronged us. See, it's just a little different than trespass and trespass against us. It's hard to associate that with our daily life, but if you're going to live such a hard life, remember the story that Jesus told of the man who was forgiven a debt, a large debt, and then he went down and chased the guy that owed him money and showed no mercy on that man? Like, that is not the kingdom of God. And again, you got to be careful. This is a fine line that we're walking because we're not saying that people should just be allowed to take advantage of you. What we are saying, I like movie scenes sometimes, and in the movie Les Mis, the guy that's played... I can't think of his name. The lead, the lead guy is an Australian actor. Help me out. You, Jackman. See, ask the audience. You guys always know. You, Jackman, steals some silver from the priest. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You saw this? And he gets caught by the police. The police bring him back to the priest, expecting the priest to press charges. And in that moment, you see a little twinkle in the priest's eye. And he says, no, you're going to learn about Jehovah Sneaky, you, Jackman. And he goes, no, I'm not going to press charges. I gave them the silver, gave him the silver, and he forgot this one. And he brings it and hands it, and the cops are all going, no way. And you, Jackman, is like, what drugs are you on right now? Nobody ever showed me mercy in my life. What's wrong with you? You're weak. This is what happens in people's heads. It's like, I wasn't taught those rules. I wasn't taught you could ever show mercy to somebody because it's a cold, cruel world. And do it to them before they do it to you. That's what I heard. And now I'm just going to give you another quick illustration. And it's a woman named Abigail uh, that you probably know about if you've ever studied the life of David. And I'm going to present her as a picture of the Holy Spirit for us today. And, you know, the Holy Spirit should be called... Holy Spirit, not the Holy Spirit, because he's a person. We don't say the Jesus. <laughs> when we pray, we say Father, not the Father. So when you speak of Holy Spirit, say Holy Spirit is the divine nature of God that's resting inside of us who will take the reins only if we let him. He doesn't force himself on us. So if we ask him, he comes or he's welcome, and that's the picture I see with, with this woman. And you have to also just think about David. I'm jumping into the story in 1 Samuel 25. He had been on the run from Saul, and he had been, you know, he had, he had a kind of a band of, uh, of people that, that were kind of the outcasts of the society, and he turned them into these mighty warriors. They, they were fighting. That's a great picture of the church, right? And while they were on the run, they were protecting the, the flocks of this one man named Nabal. And David sent his servants, which was the customary thing to do, say, hey, it's time for the harvest and, and it's time for you to show your appreciation that, that we protected your people. And this man Nabal, who his wife said was a fool, decided he was going to say, no, I'm not going to do it. And when David heard the report, so David's young man returned, told him that Nabal said no. What did he say? Strap on your swords. You've all been here, I'm guessing, right? Where it's just that final little straw that breaks the camel's back. And whatever frustration you were holding on to just goes. <laughs> and you're not in control anymore. Your emotions are in control. You've been hijacked. Happened to be going into New York one time in the Lincoln Tunnel. And you know how that is. That's an insane asylum trying to get in there during rush hour. 
And, and you know, everybody's just like, it's a game of cat and mouse. Who's going to be the one to stick their nose in? And the trucks don't care. They just go. And like, you, you can't do anything about that. But a guy in front of me, I just touched his bumper when I tell you, like, just touched the bumper. He threw the car into park. He jumped out of his car. He's screaming like a lunatic because that was his moment. See, he cracked. We got to be really careful because the devil's good at getting you to that place. And so is your family. <laughs> they know how to push the button because they've been with you the longest. So, you know, make things right because they know you well and they can just keep going ding, 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 bingo, bingo, bingo. And you don't always have the defense for it, right? So David's gone right now. Strap on your swords. More Sicilian, I think. <laughs> And he's, he and about 400 of his men. You think he needed 400 men to go to this guy's house? No, but this guy's going to know who's in charge, right? Oh, man. When you give an anointed person power and they misuse the power, that's a real Frankenstein, boy. And that's who David was at this moment. So I'm only giving you selective verses. Verse 18, Abigail, knowing the stakes, meaning she was going to die, rushed about gathering the gifts similar to what her husband should have offered. Earlier, David had made an oath. Now, this was called filter your self-talk. You see at the top? How many know that you have self-talk going on in your brain and that you can change that based on which satellite dish you're tuned into, right? So change the dish. If you're getting garbage in, garbage is coming out. Put worship music in. Put the Word of God in. Keep yourself taught well. It changes how you respond. Even the involuntary things you do. Like, you ever notice when you're driving and you're worshiping and somebody cuts you off? It's like, no big deal, brother, go ahead. I'm not in any hurry. God, thank you. You're all my life, you have been faithful. Like, you're not in as big of a hurry, right? Because, like, I'm not letting, you're not that good. You can't steal my joy, buddy. You're in a hurry. Sorry. That's your problem. I'm not making your problem my problem. <laughs> so, but this is what David's saying in his brain. It looks as though we protected everything this guy owns so that he, he, I'm sorry, lost none of the things belonging to him. We did this for nothing. We did him a good turn, and now he rewards us with evil. This is the vow. May the true God do so to my enemies and more if tomorrow morning I've left alive a single male of Nabal's house. That's called a death sentence. David was a warrior. He knew how to kill people. <laughs> All right. Remember Braveheart? When he, when he rides into the village? I like the one where he gets the guy under the neck. Man, that was a good one. Never forgot that. <laughs> David was ready to slaughter these people all because he got hijacked emotionally. Holy Spirit will step in into the breach and give you calm in your emotions and make you realize you're about to make a really big mistake. But if you ignore him, it's not his fault. You're allowing your flesh to win. So when Abigail saw David, she dropped quickly from the donkey and fell to, her, fell to the ground. The ground in front of David bowing. And again, I'm only giving you certain verses here. This is what she said. The Lord, and it's, I gave you different colors just to understand. She's talking about God there. Will certainly make for my Lord. She's talking about David. Right? She's speaking to him with respect. Because she knows that this man's been prophesied to be the king. And Saul is after him and he's on the run. So she's like reminding him just in the language that she's using. You know, the Lord has certainly made for my Lord an enduring house. Because my Lord fights the battles of the Lord. And evil is not found in you throughout your days until about a half hour from now when you get to my house. Then there's going to be a big problem. You might want to think this out. Yet a man has risen to pursue you, that's Saul, and seek your life, but the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living. Whoa. How about that picture? Ah, I'm not escaping this bundle that I'm in. I'm, I'm here living with God in God's kingdom in the earth. Sure, there's lots of nasty stuff going on out there, but my kingdom gives me a different set of instructions than cancel culture. I have mercy because I know mercy triumphs over judgment in the long run. Now, you might say, yeah, but revenge is sweet. But not to get, I don't know what the right word is, but we used to have a saying that paybacks are, you fill in the blank. That ain't sweet, okay? 
So then you're living like Israel and, pa and the Palestinians, and every year you're just fighting back and forth, and you're throwing bombs back and forth at each other, and no progress is being made. You're teaching your children to hate them from grammar school. Like, how could that be the best way to handle it? So he says, she says to him prophetically, you're still there. You haven't sinned yet. Your, your life is still bound in the bundle of the living with the Lord your God. And the lives of your enemies, he shall sling out. Sound familiar? The battle belongs to the Lord, not us. As from the pocket of a sling, and David knew slings, didn't he? And it shall come to pass when the Lord has done for my Lord, according to all that he has spoken concerning you and has appointed you ruler over Israel, that this will be no grief to you, nor offense of heart to my Lord, either that you have shed blood without cause or that my Lord has avenged himself. So he was about to spill innocent blood, and he was about to have a mark on his record that God could not bless. And he knew about that in other areas of his life later, didn't he? And then David said to Abigail, blessed is the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me. Now, can we just make this practical? Say yes. I have the mic, so I guess you're stuck. So I think that's important, right? Because the world has changed dramatically. And I've, I've asked you if, you, if you have the heart for it, to look at a documentary on TV. It's on Netflix, which I know a lot of people canceled, and we canceled it too, uh, because of that movie they put out. Uh, but look, if you can see it, it's still worth seeing. And um, it's called The Social Dilemma. And one of the graphs I never forgot, because in my business, we look at graphs all the time. And it's just a stunning graph of how quickly the, the processing speed has happened. And every one of you, if you go on the internet, every time you click on a site, it's all being tracked. So they know every site you've ever been to. They know what you like. They know what products to advertise in front of you. And look, in a way, that's not so bad. And the people in the documentary are telling you, we started out thinking this was going to be a good thing. These are all the insiders in the industry, high-level people, not with a grudge, just there to kind of bear their heart and say, it started out, we thought it was going to be a good thing, but we're not so sure it's a good thing anymore. Because what they've done with these algorithms is steer you in the direction that they want to take you. And it's very subtle, and there's a lot of money behind it, so you don't even always realize you're being dragged into, they might call it an echo chamber, where you're only going to ever hear the things that you already want to hear, and you're never getting the other side's opinion. That's kind of another day's topic, but the cancel culture is, is all around us. Look what David said, uh, 32. He said, blessed be is the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me, and blessed is your advice, and blessed are you because you've kept me this day from coming to bloodshed and from avenging myself with my own hand. Pretty smart guy, pretty alert to the spirit. Like, oh my God, I was about to make this terrible mistake, but God sent somebody to intervene on my behalf. That's what we call Holy Spirit. But it could also be a Christian filled with the Holy Spirit saying, hey, I had a dream about you. I have a word for you. I don't know if it means anything, but you should pray into this. For indeed, as the Lord God of Israel lives, who has kept me back from hurting you, unless you had hurried and come to meet me, surely by morning no males would have been left to Nabal. All right, so I'm just going to skip ahead. Sorry, I'm going backwards the wrong way. So let's just look at this for a minute. You, you can divorce yourself of culture if you want to. We are not going to divorce ourselves of culture. We think part of the reason the church is here is to speak life into a dark culture. All right? So are we supposed to tell you to vote for? No, but are, are we supposed to encourage you that you should read your Bible and compare the platforms and decide who you're going to vote for, right? Uh, at a high level, but at a, even at a lower level, this is a different thing I'm asking you to do now because remember, mercy triumphs over judgment if you're a Christian. It's harder, though. It would have been way easier for David to just take his 400 men and slaughter those guys. And, and vengeance is sweet? I mean, no, because if vengeance had been taken out on you, you wouldn't be here right now. If we got what we deserved, we wouldn't be here. So again, how do you speak truth into that without acknowledging, you know, you still have to acknowledge that what they're doing is wrong, but you, you have to love your enemy. I, I basically what it comes down to is you have to be willing to pray for people that you don't agree with and pray that there will be a revival in their life and that God will put Christians in their path and that somehow by you living a life, maybe Hacksaw Ridge could help you understand this. You know how he was somebody who was persecuted badly and yet still stuck it out. He had courage to stay with his convictions. They ended up realizing not only are you not a coward, not only are you not weak, you're the bravest guy in the whole division. 
not what we thought initially. So we're expected to live this life of a different set of rules because we're walking that narrow road that leads to life. And there's a verse right there in Proverbs 24. Don't rejoice when your enemy falls. If you're saying, hey, did you see what happened to Cuomo this week? Now look, it wasn't a good week. He's one of the people who said the reason we're having good numbers in New York. Somebody said, God, what do you think? God, God has blessed you. And he said, oh, God didn't do it. We did it. Now you would have went like this if you were standing nearby and say, oh, I don't want no lightning burns. You better be careful when you say something like that. That's saying, like, I could eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God's telling me I can't, but it doesn't matter what he thinks. I can do it. Do this all the time. I'm, I'm going to try to say that you can get to a place where you're not exactly happy that he didn't have a great week. <laughs> the other guy also didn't have a good week, but he's a Christian. And he was blocked on Twitter because of an article that they put in their magazine that, they, that Twitter said was hate language. And all they did was state a fact about somebody in the government right now. So look, if that's not sending alarm bells to you that focus on the family is getting blocked on one of the major platforms for hate speech, well, wake up. Wake up. There's a real plan going on here, but you're in a church that's been teaching on spiritual warfare since we started. So it's not a big surprise, right? It's not a surprise that pagan people sacrifice children. We call that abortion today, but that's been going on for thousands of years. So what are you going to do? Scream at them or offer them an alternative, right? We talk about this all the time. This is not an easy verse. Don't rejoice when your enemy falls and don't let your heart be glad when he stumbles. Boy, you got to fight that urge, don't you? And you really have to fight it on Facebook. And you really have to fight the snarky comments and the sarcasm because when you do that, you're becoming the very thing you don't want to be because you're not having mercy. And I'm not saying this is easy, okay, really. When I tell you this is graduate school <laughs> to be able to actually pray for your enemies. But Jesus didn't say it for no reason. It's not a theory. It's a better way to live that I don't have all this poison of unforgiveness constantly stoking through my system. I'm gonna end now, okay? Romans 12 says, beloved, don't avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. Make, you know, Realize that it's going to try to take over you and don't give place to it. I know it's like an old King James language here. Give place to it for it's written, vengeance is mine and I will repay, says the Lord. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Wow, that's a tough one, isn't it? But this is it. Look, he said, a new command I give you. This is in the Gospel of John. That you to love one another as I have loved you. If he had just said love one another, that would have been way easier, wouldn't it? But we're supposed to love one another. And he said a new commandment. There's only 10. Now he gave us 11. He gave us number 11. So that's all I'm saying. Just watch the way you emote stuff that it really lines up with what Jesus is asking us to do. Or are we acting just as happy about the, the downfall of our enemies as the world is? That's not what he asks us to do. Let's pray for them. Because if God appears to them, you know, they're going to change. <laughs> but if we're not praying for God to appear to them, then it's going to be that much harder, right? It's, I know you don't get a lot of amens with a message like this. But I just want to move forward in the Lord and not just keep recreating the patterns that have kept us stuck, right? So let's stand and let's just pray and just ask the Lord to help us get revelation to live a life that as mercy has been shown to us, we're at least willing to extend mercy to other people. That the Abigails in your life are coming and speaking to you. And that if, if your temper has so hijacked your system and your, your anger and the things that you're listening to and watching are not allowing you to have some perspective and realize that, you know, you're not wrestling against flesh and blood. You're wrestling against a spirit that's got that other person under their control. So why not pray spiritually, Lord, lift the ban off of Governor Cuomo's mind because he probably never heard the gospel presented in a way that he could understand it. And I'm not saying, maybe he did, maybe he rejected it. Maybe he's still one of those people like the Apostle Paul when he was going to kill people in Damascus. But did God intervene? Yes. 
Nobody's far, too far away from God for him not to use. And if we stand before the Lord, he could ask us, well, did you ever pray for the guy? I mean, he's not even our governor, right? I'm afraid if I mention our governor that tomatoes will start coming at me. <laughs> and not as a gift for the next meal. <laughs> so we'll leave that one until next week. <laughs> that's Mike Hutchings. That's post-traumatic stress. So <laughs> that's a good segue. Can we lift our hands? So, Lord, we, we surrender to the sovereignty of the relationship that flawed people like us are allowed to host the presence of a holy God. Like, wow, how does that even make sense that your holiness dwells in an unholy vessel other than that you love us? And we're sorry if we haven't yielded ourselves to your leading or if we've allowed things of the world to become more attractive, and we even know the song that says, the things of the world grow strangely dim in the light of your glory and your grace, Lord. So help us get back into that secret place of time with you. There's a, there's a verse in the Psalms that says, everything was too confusing until I came into the sanctuary. And then the attitude that I had outside got shifted so that we're lining up with your plans and your purposes for us, Father. We know that we're here for such a time as this. Even though we'll make mistakes because nobody's perfect, but, but we want to be people that are after your heart and not making just quick, flesh-driven decisions, but that we could pray at all times. Your word says that if we don't rule our spirit, we're like a city with the walls broken down. And we don't want to give any place to the enemy through hatred or unforgiveness or that, that, that vile thing that happens to us on the inside when we just dwell too long I'm wanting to hurt our enemies. You're telling us to speak a revival over them. So just by faith, Lord, we speak revival over those people that we disagree with, that you would make yourself real to them through us and through others, but also you visit people in the night. Just show up so that this culture can be shifted, not by might, not by power, but by your spirit. And we are your people who are called by your name. We choose to humble ourselves and pray, purpose to seek your face, turn from our wicked ways, and we know your promise is true, yes and amen, that you will hear from heaven and you will heal our land. In Jesus' name, amen. So we went a little over, but I don't recognize everybody here, so I do want to just give people a chance, if you don't know the Lord, to just say a prayer and invite the Lord to come into your life. We don't want it to be a real complicated thing, okay? it's not you're not joining it up and committing yourself to anything other than wanting to know God in a, in a richer deeper way not church God church is awesome when it's done right it can be very hurtful when it's done wrong but I'm asking you to put that aside and for a moment just say like my wife and I did both separately I can't believe that you would want a relationship with me because my life's a mess but they're telling me it is so what do I have to lose that's how we both came in the kingdom. So if that's you and you don't know the Lord, can we just say a prayer out loud together, church? You agree with me? All right, so let's say it. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I heard about mercy today, that it triumphs over judgment. I know I have sin in my life. I don't want to be judged for that sin. I want the mercy of God to move in my life to forgive me so I acknowledge that sin right now and I ask you to forgive me not be ruled by my emotions but to be ruled by the truth of your word and the power of your Holy Spirit resident inside me give me the strength Lord to turn away from my old ways and to turn towards you I accept you as my Lord and Savior today. You took the punishment that I deserved. And as you gave your life for me, I choose to give my life to you today. Thank you for your forgiveness, for saving me. Empower me now to follow you for the rest of my life and the promise of eternity thereafter. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so that could be somebody that's here. That could be somebody that's watching on the Internet. And it's a holy thing, okay? It's just a really holy thing. 
I'm guessing every person in this room right now remembers the day you made that decision. And it's a supernatural thing. But part of the way you can strengthen the decision if you're here is to take a step of faith. And instead of just walking out the back door, take a step of faith. Like I said, this is an altar, right? It's a place where we bring things and we hand them over to the Lord. We, we sacrifice what we used to hold valuable. And we say, I'm making a trade and I'm trading it for you, Lord. So if you're here and you said that prayer, can you lift your hand and just say, you said the prayer for the first time, okay? I'm not just asking you to lift your hand, but if you said the prayer for the first time and you're, and you're agreeing with what I'm saying, then can you come down to the altar? Was that you? You're already a Christian? Okay, that's what I thought. It's okay. You guys are obedient. I said lift your hand. <laughs> Well, I believe that there could be somebody online, and if somebody brought you here as a friend, have them bring you down to the front. And it could be a rededication, too. But I think you should help me. We're a team. Well, if you want to rededicate your life to the Lord, now is the time. You know, if you've been passive or if you've been pulled away and you've been disappointed and just pulled back, you know, come on, now is the time. So we want to encourage you to come up. We're happy to pray with you. Amen. So you know that we're doing a 1 o'clock service for Jim um, McCourt, we're going to say. So if you have to leave, I bless you to go and have an awesome week. If you need prayer, we're not running out. You know, we'll, we'll honor whatever social distancing that uh, is appropriate for you. For you. And, and look, I, I pray that you guys all have an awesome week. And as many as you can get here for Saturday, try to make it. It's going to be a really important day where we get equipped by, by a great man of God. I love you all. God bless you. Have a great day.